And let's go to Amsterdam. We mentioned the victory against Boris Spassky. Of course, Spassky was not yet world champion in 1964. That would be yet future. But he was already, obviously, a very strong and top player. And so here we go with knight f3, Ricard Retti's opening. Knight f6. And one thing that Darga did quite frequently in that uh, year of his chess was to start with Retti's, but transpose to c4, which is the Anglo-Indian King's Knight variation. e6, g3, b6. And after bishop g2, bishop b7, we have the Queen's Indian formation. Well, this game will actually transpose to a Queen's Indian defense after castles. Bishop e7, knight c3, castles. And here's the move that makes it into a Queen's Indian defense. Fianchetto classical traditional variation. The d4, the pawn had not been on d4 yet. So you'll find that opening in volume E, A, B, C, D, E, of your Encyclopedia of Chess Openings, section number 18, E18. Bishop B4, um, Queen to B3, Most common is pawn to d5 here, sometimes even queen to c2. Darg is the only one that played queen to b3 here, although this tabia is not unique because there are three other games that have reached this position by a different move order. Now, bishop takes knight, queen takes knight d6, b3, and knight b to d7, and now bishop to b2. So both sides with their minors out, the long diagonal open with counterpart bishops facing off, and rook to e8 is played. Again, this um, Spassky is the only one who played rook e8 from this position, but there's another game in the that reaches this using a different move order. But this position, several moves were tried, a5 a couple of times, queen e7 a couple of times, bishop e4, knight e4, and this move, rook e8. Now, rook a to d1 brings us to a definitely unique position in the game. Um, the other two games in the database that have this position, you have rook f to d1 or rook f to e1. So this is a unique game here with rook a to d1. And so that brings us to uncharted waters in the chess.com database and of course I don't know how thorough the chess.com database is it's got a couple million games in it but there it doesn't have every single game that you might find in in any given database I mean there may be more thorough databases but the one I'm using of course is the chess.com database So rook to c8 gets in line with the enemy queen. Rook f e1 now. And queen e7. d5. Queen 
And e takes d5 seems like it would be the move here, but e5. Knight h4. And knight c5. Now pawn to f4. Looking to open up some lines of attack. And uh, he just moved right on back here to uh, knight to knight f to d7. e3 here. Hello, Aesden. We are featuring today's Grandmaster Klaus Victor Darga against Boris Spassky. Today's Grandmaster is Klaus Victor Darga, who was born on this day 86 years ago. He's pictured here behind my right shoulder. I guess I could lean over for, for you to get a better view of his visage. So now A5 here. Queen C2, F6. Each side trying to inch his way forward, A3. And Rook to A8 signals Black's intention to try to open the A file. Bishop C3. Queen to f7. Getting out of the view of the rook, perhaps he also intends to try to open the e file. And rook f1 gets back in view of the queen. Um, you can continue to press here with b4, although you may not want to assist your opponent to open the A-file. E4 is a candidate move. Obstructing this guy, he's going to be biting on granite and then have the idea of relocating him. He played Rook F1. And the idea, of course, is to try to keep an attack and heat on that queen. Well, E takes, and then E takes. Well, now black's left with the open file. So, perhaps not recommendable to relinquish that file with rook f1. Now, A4, and it's likely white does not want to allow that file to open. So b4, knight b3 occupies this weak square. And white has some ideas. He may want to just start trying to break this open. He tried knight to f5 here. Where's the knight going to go from there? Um, is he going to make his way to this weak square? That may be his plan. Although this knight would prevent that from transpiring. So I think if you play knight d4, knight just takes knight. Knight f8 also jumps back and says, uh, you know what, I'm going to keep an eye on that. No, for me that would be there's not much utility in this move because it's completely defensive I'm not sure about that move knight to f8 this is one of those things where these grandmasters they jockey their pieces around and and do a lot of dancing 
And even so, this rook has the open file. It cannot improve. Every square is hot. Every single square. Okay. Every square, except the one upon which it stands, is hot. Everything. So, though you have the open file, there's not anything you can do with it at present. And what else are you going to do? Come back here and try to get rid of the knight? I don't know. So knight f8 is played. Now knight d4 is, in fact, played. Putting the question here, you got two attackers and only one defender. So black cannot allow white to get a knight and a pawn for a knight. So this is compelled. Knight takes knight, and then bishop takes knight. So now black might want to try to reposition his bishop somewhere, although where, where from c8? He tried queen g6. And the queens are traded off here. Now why not take that with the knight? I mean, this knight is not well placed on f8. Why not get it back into the game-ish? I know, the, where's it going from there? It doesn't really have a, a where to go from here, so. But there's no need to break your pawn shield. Rook fe1 now occupies that open file and contests it. King f7, King f2, both players beginning to transition toward the end game. Hello, chess on earth. Bishop a6, Bishop f1 defends. Okay, pawn to f5 gives the knight perhaps somewhere to go oops i can't draw my arrows today when have i been able to one set of rooks are traded and the next trade is offered He declines that trade. He wants to keep his rook on the board. Bishop d3. And now the knight does come to d7. Quite get there yet. White has slightly better mobility, doesn't he? He plays b5. It's an interesting move. The bishop has to retreat, but it does create a place for the knight, although the dark squared bishop can deal with it. Yes, exactly, chess on earth. Exactly. The main thing, I think, for this move is to prevent any ability to defend a4. a4 is going to become an easy target now. Even so, the knight can come here. The dark squared bishop can trade itself off. Okay, the rook can come over, I suppose, and defend. 
but it puts the rook completely out of play. Bishop b7, bishop c2 in fact is played, and knight c5, he's basically saying, now I'm going to abandon my pawn because this doesn't really defend. And White says, I'm not interested in that pawn anyway. Now, personally, Coach Daniel, hey, thank you. Uh, Tomas E4 has been gifted a sub here at the King's Bishop channel by Chess on Earth. And that's going to really help us out. And that, sitting at 65 subs, that'll make 66. The update should come shortly. Wouldn't it be nice to make it to 70? Now, some of you chess.com viewers, come on over here to twitch.tv slash kingsbishop. And I'll put it in your chat window. Notice the spelling there. Come on over here if you're a chess TV viewer and give me a subscription. I would much appreciate that. <clears throat> so anyway, um, he played h4. I'm very interested in this pawn. I don't know if you're ever going to make this. Chess on Earth gifting more gifts. Look at that. Four more subs gifted by Chess on Earth. Congratulations to Chessmates Buzz, Jacuzzi, Prairie Pirates 1, and Dead Brazel. Thank you, Chess on Earth. How generous. Uh, I really appreciate that. And that sub count should update sh shortly to the, the appropriate number on the screen here. What a blessing. Thank you, Chess on Earth. Okay, so what about capturing this pawn, uh, this knight? And when he recaptures, I guess, I guess you can't really capture because then the rook can just come over. I'm seeing things. I'm imagining things. And you really don't want his rook coming over. So, okay. I retract my my idea. So he played... Oops. Didn't mean to go there. What happened? Sorry. I accidentally hit the wrong button. I accidentally hit the wrong button. Let's get back to where we were. H4. H4. Now knight B3. Attacking the bishop. Bishop C3. Bishop C8. But the poor bishop has nowhere to go. His F-man constrains him. White's D-man prevents him. His only other where to go is D7. And from there he has nowhere to go. <laughs> kind of feel sorry for that bishop. This also is possibly inviting... Bishop takes, knight, pawn takes, and then rook b1. It may still be trying to entice white to go after that a pawn. But this a pawn is, is backward. It's going to be easy for black to attack and hard for white to defend. I don't know. Maybe it's an idea. Takes, takes, come over, takes. Get that pawn moving. Get behind that pawn. And, and then you have, if you can get your rook behind it, you have the bishop and 
the rook looking at a5. To me, it's still an idea, but... Rook e3. Ah, rook e3 might be an idea to follow up on that, I that plan in a different way. Bishop d7 gives the rook access back to the a file. Rook back to e1. Maybe if you play bishop to b4, you can defend your pawn and have this super attack. I know I'm fixed on this. I'm not letting it go. I'm, I'm hung up on this pawn that looks like it wants to be captured. It's, it's almost begging to be captured. This has got to be a good idea, though, yes? Okay, he played rook e1. Rook g8. Rook e3. And now the knight retreats back to c5. Bishop d4. Now rook a8. And now king e1. Knight e4. Well, knight e4, is that an invitation to win a pawn? Well, it is, but it's he's more interested in liberating his bishop. Black is saying, I'll let you have that pawn, but finally, my bishop can join Martin Luther King Jr. and say, free at last, free at last. <laughs> so he declines that. Bishop d1. Rook to e8. And now he takes the pawn. That pawn finally got captured. I can finally sleep at night. <laughs> Look at that sub count, 70 subs. That really looks nice. What a nice milestone. Thank you, everybody. You know, I'm sure two-thirds of those subs have been gifted by Chris James, by Chess on Earth, by Rotkopf, or Rotschopf, I found out is the way he's pronouncing it. Okay, I missed something here. Ah, that was nifty. That was a nifty little grab there by Black. I mean, the rook is pinned, so it cannot come over. So he has to trade himself off. Very nifty indeed. He brings the bishop back to c2. Knight to h5. Bishop to e3 defends, king e7. And we are in for a very interesting endgame. a4. King's making his way toward the his pawn deficit to help his three pawns against the four. a5. B takes A5, King D2, now his king will make his way to the queen's side. Knight G3, King C3, pawn to G5. Again, the purpose of pawn to G5 is to grant his bishop mobility. Mobility that the bishop does not enjoy at the time. And sure enough, he wastes no time getting into a position where he can try to attack. King b3. And there he zooms right down. He's not going to waste any time putting heat on this backward pawn. Bishop d2 now. A4 check, and you don't take it with the king and let him take. You step out of the way, 
and attack with your bishop. That way you can maintain the defense of your backward pawn. But he plays a3. He says, oh, please take this pawn. Bishop b3, no such luck. I'm going to defend my pawn first. And now your pawn is gone. Knight e4 attacks the bishop. Bishop e3, g6. Now king takes pawn. Knight c5 striking at the bishop. He traded. He could have played bishop a2 as well. Both are just as good, I think. Of course, now these two isolated pawns would make for easier targets. And black can't win this game. Best he can hope for is a draw. White's the one with the power. I gather he'll just make his way right on up here. Just leave that bishop there. These pawns are untouchable, being on dark squares. There is no path for the king to encroach on the king's side. So I would imagine white's plan is to march his king into black territory. That's what I would do. He does play king a4, bishop d3, king a5, bishop e2. All you can do is go back and forth. b6. c takes b6, check. And now this is soon to be gone, yes? Well, king d6 defends. But soon you'll be in some sort of a Tsugsvang, I guess. Let's see, the plan now. How can we outflank? You have to triangulate. You have to triangulate here so that you, your king ends up here when his king is on d7. You want his king on d7 when you're not on d7 so that you can then play to b7. So then no matter which way he goes, you can outflank him. So, yeah, king b5, king a6. Um, king b5 might work. I would just play a move that makes him make a move. So he plays, okay, he starts with, oh, that's interesting. He didn't oppose him. I thought surely he'd oppose. Oh, I see. He can't really oppose because then you can give check. I just realized that. Then you'd have to come back and then you defend. And now the king can't stop your king from encroachment. So he immediately played king b7 saying, you want to take the opposition? Zymine and Gust. And here he goes. Well, why did he come back? I'm cu curious, why is he coming back? I'm confused. Why did he come back, ladles and jelly spoons? He came all the way here and then didn't go for it. He came back. Why is this not working? Anybody know? Why is that not working? Ah! Oh! He's got a stalemate. He realized that Boris Spassky has a stalemate. Look at that. He can just take this pawn. And that's going to compel bishop takes bishop. Oh, man. Oh, shrewd. Very shrewd. I would have fallen right for it. 
I mean, it looked like he was following my, my plans. I would have fallen right for that. This, ladles and jelly spoons, is stalemate. The white king blocking off the seventh rank. The white pawn blocking off e e6 and c6. And the other pawn blocking off e5. That would have been... So he started that way. And then he said, wait a minute. And good for Darga for spotting that resource that Black had. So he starts beelining it back. Now that's a beautiful... I've got to give Spassky a pat on the back right there for that effort. But Darga realizes it and repositions now and says, okay, we're going to do something more different here. And now we've got this massive repositioning. A lot of dancing around going on here. Now he's going to get his bishop back here. Man, this is quite a game. Ho <laughs> ho! Oh my goodness. And on and on. We're on move 90 right here. Move 90. <laughs> I'm still enjoying that stalemate threat. Bishop E2. I think he has to stay this way. Uh, although it doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, he'll just come down. Of course you can come. I guess by now it's it's six of one and half of a dozen of the other. And now, now he resigned here. Now it's all over but the crying. Now there are no stalemates. Let's go back to that one position where I'm like, oh yeah, just work your way around and, you know, attack over here. The king can't defend the pawn and stop your pawn, so... So make your way. But sure enough, if you play this, it's a stalemate. It's a forced stalemate because you don't dare uh, not capture the bishop. You don't dare play something like, you know, bishop d1, and then you're suddenly facing a passed pawn. So it would be a forced stalemate. Beauty. Beauty, beauty. So you recognized it, and you get this dance going on, and we'll just page through it one more time. And he says, I'm going to now come around and he gives up that pawn. I don't know if that, he has to give up that pawn, does he? I guess it does. I guess it's irrelevant because the Black Sea Man will fall. So Bishop A4 and black resigned now let's look at the numbers <clears throat> white has an accuracy here of 97.42 and black has an accuracy of 96.99 so this is a very high quality game with both players scoring a higher than 95 accuracy and both players scoring higher than 60% best move ratio. White's best move ratio, 62.5. And Black's, 61.1% best move ratio. That is a remarkable game. <laughs>